Our scripture passage this morning comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 8 of Luke's Gospel, verses 16 through 18. Hear now the word of the Lord. No one lights a lamp and then covers it with a bowl or puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on top of a lampstand so that those who enter can see the light. Nothing is hidden that won't be exposed. Nor is anything concealed that won't be made known and brought to the light. Therefore, listen carefully. Those who have will receive more. But as for those who don't have, even what they seem to have will be taken away from them. This is the word of the Lord. We pray with you. Almighty God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Pour out your spirit upon us this day, in this hour, in this place. Open our ears to hear a word from you. Stir our spirits. Delight our imagination with your promise. Your promise of a future filled with hope. And God, may the words of my mind and the meditations of all of your children's hearts be weighed and measured and deemed acceptable in your sight. And God's people say. So today we're going to conclude a three-week series of sermons in which we have considered two parables from the Gospel according to Luke. For the last two weeks we've talked about the parable of the sower. And this morning we're going to look at a parable commonly known as the parable of a lamp on a stand. Now we've looked at these from the viewpoint of the local church, of this church, right? We've talked about the past. We've talked about the present. We've talked about how seed, seed rather, seed has been scattered from this place, in this place, throughout the history of this congregation. We took a look at how our present efforts, what we're doing today, stacks up against that. And now this morning, we're going to talk about the future. We're going to dream about how brightly our future work in ministry might shine forth from this place, God's house. How it might shine forth from this building and spread out across our community to illuminate a better future in this world that God has called us to care for. So I invite you, as I always do, to turn over your bulletin to the back page where you're going to find uh, the compass that will guide our discussion this morning. The parable from Luke's Gospel is printed here at the top, and there is, as always, a place for you to take some notes. Every Sunday, you hear me give the same spiel. I encourage you to take notes because I believe that God just doesn't speak to preachers. I believe God still speaks to people and that God has something special to say just for you this morning. And I want you to have the opportunity to write that down. But I'm also hoping that uh, you're going to write down some ideas this morning to speak to your heart. You're going to write down some thoughts and uh, tasks and jobs and ideas that resonate with you as we dream about that future filled with hope. Because I'm going to unload a lot of ideas on you this morning. So I gave you ample space to take notes and remember some of them because this will be the first time you'll hear of them. But I promise you it won't be the last. Alright? So I want you to have space to write down those things that resonate with you. Now, one of the things I've learned about this congregation over the course of our time together this last almost two years now is that this body of Christ is incredibly good at caring for each other. Your lives are tightly woven together. All of you. You talk with one another frequently. You step in immediately to help each other out in times of need. You pray for one another. Why? 
and you are quick to offer acts of love and words of encouragement wherever they might be needed. And as I said to you last Sunday morning, this is a tremendous source of strength, church. A tremendous source of strength that we should pay close attention to and that we should continue to cultivate in this congregation. But as we continue to read through the Gospel according to Luke and we look at the second parable this morning, we find that Jesus illuminates for us the greatest challenge to this source of strength. There is a challenge to this source of strength. We care for one another. We are very, very good at that, church. But who else notices? Who else notices how well we care for one another? How do the words and the actions that we can say, convey one to another resonate with the community that exists beyond the walls of this building? I may have shared this with you before, but uh, a little while ago, it's been a number of weeks, I drove around Hugo. Uh, I did this right after I bought my new van so that it might not be recognized. And I drove around Hugo in my new van, and I stopped at all the gas stations. And I went in different times of the day, and I would go up to the gas station attendant and ask him, excuse me, can you tell me how to get to the United Methodist Church? You notice I said the United Methodist Church. How many United Methodist Churches are there in Hugo? <coughs> three. Three. So they had a one in three chance of getting it right. I thought the odds would be pretty good here. And I did this, I stopped at every gas station and said, excuse me, can you tell me how to get to the United Methodist Church? And they were all very kind, but not a one of them could give me directions to one of our buildings. Not a single person that I spoke with working at the gas stations in this community knew how to find a United Methodist Church in Hugo. The light of God's love burns brightly in this place, doesn't it? But it seems to me that over the course of time we've covered ourselves up. Nobody else can see that light. And Jesus, in this parable, reminds us that this is a really bad idea. This is not a good thing. As Christians, we are called by God in Christ to show ourselves. To proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. To shine brightly in the midst of a world that is often dim and dark and troubling. We need to be seen. We need to be heard. We need to be known. Because the light of love that we offer is a source of strength. We know that. And Christ calls us to share this strength, not just with ourselves, but with others, or even with non-Christians too. We can't transform the world. We can't live the mission statement on the front of our bulletin if we only look out for one another. When we do that, we leave the fields barren. We talked about this last Sunday. We leave the fields barren and nothing out there changes. And Jesus would call this putting our life under a basket. A place where no one else can see it. It used to be that the light of Christ would be revealed to people whenever they came in through our doors. They would be welcomed and encouraged and engaged in the life of a church community when they came through our doors. They would get plugged in and connected and be just awash in the light of the love of God. But the problem is they don't come like they used to. Do that. That light's still available, but they don't come like they used to. The challenge for us is that we got comfortable in that mindset, didn't we? Waiting on the people to come to us every time we open the doors of the church on Sunday morning. We got comfortable not just here in this place, but in most mainline congregations throughout the United States. We got comfortable with that strategy. That was our marketing <coughs> strategy. That's how we got it done. We throw open the doors and the people would come rushing in and this worked throughout the 20th century all the way up until, well, really the turn of the 21st, and then it started to change on us. And, and that's a long time. That's several generations of people. That's not just one, but many 
generations of people who are raised up with that marketing strategy in the life of the church. And as we raised up new generations in the comfort of that strategy, we forgot something. We forgot the Great Commission. Jesus offers the Great Commandment, but also the Great Commission. And we forgot it because there was a time when people would just come to us and they would say, yes, I want to get plugged in and connected to your church, make me a member, baptize me, let me give my affirmation of faith, put me on every committee you've got, and put me to work. Because we used to be a social center in our communities throughout the city. And so, because the people would just come to us, we, we forgot how to go out into the highways and the byways. We forgot how to invite others come in and be guests at God's banquet. We got so tied up in the rituals and the orders of our royal priesthood that we neglected to proclaim the gospel out in those places where it has yet to be heard. We forgot to take our seat with us when we left. And so we put our life under a basket. And we have done a really good job of guarding and protecting that life. We kept it burning right under the basket, but so many can't see it anymore. And you know, it would be easy for us to just cast blame right now. I've heard it done many a time, and I've done it myself from time to time in moments of frustration. Here's how blame works. If you want to take this strategy, here's a strategy you can try. Society is the problem. Our culture is the problem. Our media is the problem. People's schedules are the problem. They have hectic, busy lives. People today are more interested, we could say, in connecting through Facebook than finding a church home. We might say people don't have the respect that they used to, either for their elders or for the traditions of the church. We can think that. We can take that as an excuse. But here's the thing. If you look in the Gospels, you'll notice something interesting. Jesus never condemns the non-believer because they didn't seek him out. He doesn't do that anywhere in the Gospels. Nowhere in the Gospels does Jesus get upset about the people who don't take it upon themselves to find him and know him and learn from him. That doesn't happen. That just makes us upset. But Jesus gets upset throughout the Gospels, time and time again, when those who have found Him, those who do know Him, and those who say they seek to learn from Him, fail to do the things He asks them to do. Jesus gets upset with His disciples when they don't understand the things He is asking them to do. Jesus gets upset with the crowds who gather around Him when they fail to follow and live His instructions. Jesus gets upset when people take hold of the light that is offered to them only to cover it up with a basket and keep it for themselves. Jesus gets upset when his followers turn into fans. Jesus invites us in this passage to stop blaming, fretting, and worrying when nobody else seems to be paying attention to where we are or what we think about how things ought to be. Jesus reminds us instead that it's not about us and what we think at all. Not what I think, not what you think. The light of God's love will overtake the darkness, Jesus says, with or without you and me. Have you ever heard the saying to those who have been given much much is expected. To those who have been given much, much is expected. Anybody ever heard that before? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, a few. Here's a new one for everybody else. To those who have been given much, much is expected. Jesus says that those who take the light and then they spread it around will find themselves in the light. Surrounded by even more light. Have you ever seen that actually work? Think about your life for a minute. Have any of you in this room ever done something nice for somebody else? Ever in your lives have you done something nice for somebody else? All right. Good. Now, keep your hands up. 
Okay, those of you who have done something nice for somebody else, every hand is up here, this is good. Uh, how many of you have done something nice for somebody else and expected nothing in return? If you've ever done that and expected nothing in return, keep your hands up. How many of you, when you did that thing and expected nothing in return, found that your own life ended up better as a result? Good. You get what you give, don't you? You reap what you sow in this life, don't you? But when we keep that life to ourselves, hidden under a basket, Jesus warns us in this parable, the light's going to go out. Have you ever taken a candle and put it in a jar? Have you ever taken a candle and put a jar over it? And not just very slowly and carefully, but just drop that jar down on the candle? What's going to happen to that flame? It's going to go out wide. There's no air. The airflow is gone. Right? There's no more oxygen. It's not breathing. It's not getting new life. It's not being renewed. That candle is going to go out when you cover it up eventually. And Jesus says that when we cover that light up with a basket, even what we thought we had, we're going to lose it. Our security, our protection is an illusion. If we don't get rid of the basket, the light of love that we know is eventually going to go out. So what are we supposed to do about that? How do we let the light out from underneath that basket? When I came here as your pastor, a number of people said something to me. They said, Phil, we're looking for a leader. We're looking for a leader. We're ready to go. We're ready to follow Jesus. Well, friends, you got me through seminary. You put up with a year and a half of Dallas and Houston and traveling and everything else. And it's time. It's time. I'm ready to leave. What about you? Are you ready to throw off the basket? Are you ready to let that light shine out in this good I'm ready. On Thursday afternoon of this week, at about 3.30, I received a very helpful text message on my phone. I received a, a great text message, and in this message, I was informed that at 4 o'clock that afternoon, the homecoming parade would pass by out here on 2nd Street. It would pass by the church and pass by uh, my house, and I would, it was suggested to me that I should take Xander outside so he could see it. Unfortunately, Xander wasn't home. But and I was in the office, and so I went out to the window at 4 o'clock, and you know what I saw? I looked right out. I walked up those stairs back out by the west entrance, and I looked out of the third floor window on the landing there, and I saw the street lined with cars, and the parking lot over there was filled with cars, and there were cars everywhere, and there were families with children packed in the grass along the funeral hall. And it was busy, busy, busy. And at 4 o'clock, I heard the sirens and the sounds and the parade went by. And at 4.22, the people were gone. And the cars had been moved. And the streets were empty. What if, at 3.30, Thursday afternoon, we had inflated one of those big, giant, balanced houses on the grass in front of the church and brought out coolers full of bottled water and maybe started grilling hot dogs. What if we as a congregation got our t-shirts out, something that said, I am a member of the United Methodist Church and we have been there to offer cold drinks or hot dogs or help 
little kids get their shoes on and off so they can jump in a bounce house before the parade and then go back to jumping for a few minutes after and work off some of that energy before they went home for the evening. And if we had been there shaking hands and meeting those families and children that were here in our neighborhood to watch the parade, do you think any of those people, after they left on Thursday, might be able to tell me, should they run into me at a gas station, if that had happened, where it was that I might find the United Methodist Church in Hugo? I think so. I think they remember. Christmas is coming. The Christmas parade is coming. It's not that far away now. So let's get rid of our basket. This is the time where you can start thinking about this. Let's get rid of our basket. Let's let the light of Christ shine brightly throughout our community in this great season. Let's have a booth at the Christmas parade. The Cowboy Church does it. Why shouldn't we? Maybe we can give out cookies. Christmas cookies. Something simple, sugar cookies with a little bit of the icing and the pretty pictures on them and the trees and the Santa Claus and every the angels and everything else. I know you can pay in the church. I know you can do that. What if we had just boxes of Christmas cookies and we handed those out? And while we're at it, let's take a pickup truck and let's put it right next to our display. The bed of a pickup truck and on the bed of that pickup truck, let's put a children's bed. All decorated and ready to go. Just like we're going to put up here again for Christmas this year. And let's share with our community the excitement we have about our Christmas Eve offering. A tradition we started last year in which we bought beds for children in this community who currently sleep on the floor. We bought four beds last year. In four weeks we raised almost $2,500. Let's invite others to catch that excitement. Let's make other people aware that this is actually still a problem in Hugo, Oklahoma. And let's take that bed and have a raffle at the Christmas parade. Let's give it away. Let's give it away. We'll invite people to register for a drawing <coughs> during the parade. A drawing. And this will give us a unique opportunity. It's kind of like attendance pads in church. It gives us the chance to learn people's names, to learn where they live, to gather their phone number and their email address, and then maybe we'll have a little postcard there and we can invite them to join us on Christmas Eve. And we might invite them to participate in our Christmas Eve offering and make a donation to this cause right there on the spot at the parade so that we can buy even more beds for Jesus than we could do on our own. Let's make this a Christmas tradition. Let's let our light shine in this way. Here's what we need. We need just a few servants. A few servants. We need some servants to bake cookies. We need a few servants willing to register for people for the drawing to say hello and introduce themselves and take down some information for them and hand them a ticket. We need a few servants willing, out, willing to pass out cookies and willing to pass out that invitational postcard that invites people to come on Christmas Eve and join us in praise and celebration and worship and we need people willing to do it for this time. We need just a few servants who are willing to ditch the basket and let the loving light of Christ shine brightly in our community. So let's start another new Christmas tradition here in Hugo. And then comes Easter. Then comes Easter, the next big day in the Christian year, Easter Sunday. And Easter Sunday, my friends, should be one of those times in the year when our attendance picks up. And the church is alive with activity. But you know what? Since I've been here, our attendance on Easter has stayed the same as it's been for a number of years. It hasn't gone up, it hasn't gone down, but it stayed the same. Easter is a time when the resurrection is made visible by the movement of the body of Christ in a community, and yet we stay the same. Our numbers haven't gone up. So you know what we should do? We should throw a resurrection party. 
We should throw a resurrection party. We'll do it the weekend before Easter. And we'll do it at the park. We'll do it at the park. In the spring. We need some servants to organize an Easter egg roll for kids. We need some servants maybe to bake some cakes or pies. Maybe we'll have a cake walk. We'll give away a prize again. We'll have another drawing where we can collect names and information and invite people to join us here on Easter Sunday. Maybe we'll give away a children's bicycle. And we'll invite all 4,000 people who live within one mile of this congregation to come and join us for a resurrection party. These events are called bridge events. They have a name, they're called bridge events. Opportunities for congregations to network in their communities outside the walls of the church building. These are critical, critical events in growing church in reaching out and meeting new people. And we need opportunities to gather information about our community and opportunities to shine the light of Christ forward into the world. So I propose two events to you this morning. What would it look like if we got rid of our basket? If we let the light of Christ penetrate those dark places in our community and we ourselves were the bearers of that light and we took it. To effectively achieve its mission, every successful organization in the world knows that tangible, measurable goals need to be set and tracked. Our mission is to, do you remember? Make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. This sounds like a really big task. The other night at the church council meeting, I handed out a little metric that the conference has asked us to fill out and a couple of people said to me, wow, this is really hard. These questions are really hard when we first look at them. But what we're seeking is a measurable, tangible way to calculate how we're doing. To make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world sounds like a really big task at first, but we can measure our success by organizing and successfully implementing events like the two that I've just talked to you about. But sometimes, an organization needs to grab hold of what uh, is called in the business world a big, hairy, audacious goal. A big, hairy, audacious goal. Something that sets the tone for everything else that organization sets out to do. Something that inspires, something that excites, and something that sustains momentum over time. I think we need that something here. We need that big, hairy, audacious goal. So turn on your bulletin in the front. What you see? I think the building is what you see. This here is a, an empty building that I took a picture of and dressed up on my computer. It's right downtown. It has lots of parking. It's in the middle of everything, and I pass by it almost every single day. You know, when Jesus gave his life for us, God knew that the ending in Mark's gospel, the ending we study, at Easter last year uh, was not going to be good enough. God knew that the ending with his death on the cross and then the empty tomb and then his disappearance was not going to be good enough. God knew that the gift and sacrifice of his only son to save us from ourselves would not get the point across completely. God knew that we needed something more. God knew that we needed resurrection. We needed not only sacrifice, we needed victory too. And God loves us so much that He gave us that victory. He gave us resurrection. He gave us new life in Christ. We need a resurrection today. Our community needs a resurrection today. This picture is not about the building, okay? The building was an attention-getting device. 
I did this because I knew you could all recognize what this building used to be. And if you drive by it, you'll see what it is now. So I put some dressing on it to give you an idea of what something that's empty and abandoned can look like with a resurrection. The building is not the point. Here's the point. There are approximately 1,697 children between the ages of 5 and 18 in Chico, Oklahoma today. I'm going to check my numbers with Karen this week, but I think they're pretty accurate from what I can find. 1,800, uh, I'm sorry, 697 children between the ages of 5 and 18 in Hugo today. And if you look around at Hugo, after school lets out, there is very little for them to do. If you've ever been out to the Boys and Girls Club, they have a fantastic organization, but their facility is really not all that big. They can only accommodate so many kids at the Boys and Girls Club today. These kids need activities. They need nurture, just as Christ nurtured his followers and made them disciples, so he calls us to nurture all God's children into lives of discipleship today. The task has not changed. That's the great commission. So Methodists, let's create a place where kids can play basketball after school. Let's create a place where kids can come and see the light of Christ reflected back to them in our eyes. Servants. A number of years ago, somebody shared with me that uh, within the walls of this congregation, there was discussion about starting a daycare. And for various reasons, it didn't happen. I went through, and there's 150 pages that explain the state of Oklahoma's requirements for launching a daycare in 2013. I've read them all. And I can tell you something. Uh, we, the United Methodist Churches in Hugo, none of us, have the facilities requisite to house a daycare today. We wouldn't pass inspection. None of our buildings anywhere in Hugo would pass the requirements available today. But I'm the parent of a toddler. And I can tell you from personal experience, after waiting six months on a wait list to get my kid into the only daycare in town that I'm walking in, there's a need. There is a need. Did you know that uh, about 27% of your community lives in poverty, but only 4% are effectively unemployed? People are working, and children have no place to go. People are working, and children have no place to go. My home church uh, in Lafayette, Indiana, 20 years ago, launched the daycare program. And what they did was they used their facilities and they set them up. They got everything ready to go and then they rented the space to somebody who actually wanted to run a daycare. And they used that rent as income to help take care of the building itself. The daycare paid for the building. They didn't sacrifice their time to run the daycare. They didn't get the training or do anything necessary to run the daycare. They built it. And somebody else filled it up. Families have a need in our community. Children have a need in our community. We talk all the time about the next generation. Well, let's go out and get them. Let's go out and get them. We have facilities that are designed to worship God. A beautiful space designed to worship God. But we don't have the facilities to do these other things. So let's come together and build them. Somewhere. In an idea like this or someplace else in Cuba. Let's make this our mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ right from the very beginning to transform the world. Let's engage our community by creating the space for new business to thrive. By creating the space for after school programs that will keep our kids safer. Maybe even we could organize a three-on-three -three basketball league that met every Saturday morning and pray together and play ball. Did you know that the average age of adults in Hugo is 36 and the average age of our congregation is much higher than that? This is a big, hairy, audacious goal, church. And some are probably thinking right now this. They're thinking, preacher, you're nuts. We could never afford to do that. And we need to worry about what we've already got. We've got to take care of the light that's under the basket.
if we stay under the basket, our light's going to go out. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow. But if we deprive it of oxygen and new life, it's going to go out. The Oklahoma Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church just this week announced the creation of a new matching grant. A new matching grant that is specifically designed for churches just like you. Small membership churches. Just like this one. And in this grant, according to the terms they released this week, they will match dollar for dollar every dollar we raise for a capital campaign up to $5,000. We raise five, we get ten. They will turn $5,000, every dollar up to $5,000, into double that. For a small membership church that launches a capital campaign designed to create a brand new ministry opportunity in their community that benefits the larger community they live in, makes disciples in a different way, and seeks to transform the world. But you know what? We can't take this on by ourselves. So let's get together with Paul's Chapel and let's get together with Wesley, all three churches in the uh, United Methodist Churches of Hugo. Let's come together and raise this money. Let's raise $5,000 and let's turn it into ten. You know what we'd be doing if we succeeded at that? We'd scatter the seed. New seed in our community. We would have a down payment on a future filled with hope. And this would offer the conference the opportunity they've been looking for, a chance to invest and invigorate in the very place where Methodism began. Did you know that? In Oklahoma, Methodism began right in your backyard. It didn't start in Oklahoma City or Tulsa. It started right here. The very first Methodist missionaries who came into the land called Oklahoma came into Fort Towson and Hugo to spread the good news. This is where it all began. This place was the start of Methodist mission in Oklahoma. Let's have a resurrection of mission today. If we take on goals like these, whether it's throwing a party for Easter, a resurrection party, whether it's going out and participating in the Christmas parade and inviting others to come into our midst and giving away a bed so that we might buy even more beds for Jesus this year, or it's creating a new and safe environment in which our children in this community can play and grow and come to know us and God. If we're committed and we're ready to stand up and lead and follow, God will make a way. And the United Methodist Church has offered a place for us to begin. We need a resurrection. It is foundational to our faith and it begins with the light that God has placed in every one of your hearts through the love and gift and sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I've given you a lot to think about this morning. This is, as I said, the first you've heard of these ideas and it won't be the last, but remember that's all they are, they're ideas. These are grist for the mill of the world. Minds. And I invite you to consider them perfectly. Think about it. Ask God to stir ideas in your heart and then come and please share those ideas with me. However the Spirit moves us, whether it's these or other things, however the Spirit moves us, it's time for us to shine forward, church. It's time for us to lead. Amen. And amen.